A conversation with a millionaire retired landlord. That's today's show. Let's dive into it. Hey everyone, I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And this is the Investing in Real Estate show where we talk about building financial freedom through passive income so you can spend more time with your family. So in the middle of the afternoon, you can go to your little girl's uh, swim lesson. Um, you don't have to commute two hours to and from work every day. It's about giving more time back to you and your life. And the vehicle that we use is buy and hold real estate. So if you were joining us on a recent podcast, I think a few, maybe two months ago yeah we did an we did an episode where we were dissecting a deal that had come into our laps our accountant our accounting team at provision had said look you guys if you want to offset some of the the money that you were going to get because of your 401k cash out and transfer that that taxable event right he transferred a 401k into a Roth IRA because we chose to pay taxes on it this year because we intend to grow it so much that when he hits retirement we don't want to pay taxes when we withdraw so we took a big chunk of change and convert a bit and that's a taxable event at our current tax rate which is the highest tax bracket so our accountant said oh well if you buy about two million dollars in real estate then that will sort of mitigate your taxation on this so we said okay let's go find two million dollars of real estate to purchase so this deal we've talked about was a package of ten properties that was owned by a person a family a man and his wife and he was he's now in his 70s and he was ready to retire so this is a deal that I've been working on really hard for a long time working with the wholesaler working with the title company it just takes a while to close a big package like this but I wasn't the one who went to the title company and closed it yesterday because we didn't have a sitter for that long and a two-hour closing with a one-year-old would right. have been no good so Clayton went yesterday and he came back and he said this guy was amazing and the reason that I wanted to go to this closing because we do hundreds of properties a year we close hundreds of properties a year I never once, I never even see the houses. I never go to closings. My team handles all of that, right? You can do it almost all electronically through a title company. You've got a good title people. They do all of that. So I just send a signature. We send a wire. We mm -hmm. buy the properties. Good. Done. Wash my hands of it and we're on to the next property. With this particular situation, though, I could have done that. We could have with right. our title company. Sent, they were willing to send a mobile notary. Yeah, they were going to send a mobile notary. But you and I talked about it, and we realized the reason we wanted to do today's podcast around this is because this guy is a multimillionaire real estate investor. And what we started to understand about this gentleman as he was in his retirement years now with his wife, his kids are all fully grown and gone. He and his wife have a house in France that they spend two months a year uh, visiting and enjoying. They also have a house in Florida. They, in Florida, in right. Key West. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, this is, this looks like it would be the sort of the perfect rich dad opportunity for me to go and sit down with a mentor. I've often said it here on the show before, there's a lot of millionaires who have been made in real estate investing that you would never know them right. to look at them. Yeah. You probably pass them on the street all the time. You wouldn't know them. They're not famous. They don't have a TV face, right? Right. But they are millionaires and they're living comfortably with their wives for two months out of the year going to France. So right. she couldn't go. I wanted to meet him and I wanted, we sat for two hours at this closing, yeah. which normally closings for us take five minutes, but this one, it dragged on incredible conversations with this yeah. guy. And I felt like it was important for you to go and talk to him as well because we don't have a team in this market. Mm -hmm. This is a new market for us. So we don't have, we had to find a property manager. We don't have a construction crew there. So we needed to talk to him to get sort of the lay of the land for owning this property, which he's owned for 40 years. 40 years, yeah. Right. Military housing. And so we. this wasn't like a project we were doing for our company. We wanted it because we needed it for tax reasons. And when we when this package presented itself to us, we're like, oh yeah, the numbers through work. a friend of mine. I said, you know what? Let's just grab this one ourselves. Yeah. And then we put the we were gonna. If you watch the previous episode that we talked about this package of properties, uh, maybe a few months ago, or the audio episode, we talked about how we were gonna structure it. And so we were gonna do private financing. Right. We were gonna do a loan on this property, and we were gonna start looking at ways to just put down a down payment mm -hmm. and have private financing carry the rest. 
Right, so that didn't go the way I had intended because these properties appraised all over the map. And that's kind of the problem when you go with a private financer is that they live and die by the appraisal. So they outsourced the appraisal to this company called they were laughable. One Source. I mean, literally one of them came in and I responded, LOL, 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 LOL. <laughs> that, like like that's idiot. all I did and I pushed return because I was like, oh. you gotta be kidding me. Because they're not duplexes, but they share a wall. So they sort of are they're they're zoned as single family but they they share a wall and they're all cookie cutter they were made military housing because there's a base nearby and so they are literally the exact same house and they've all been maintained by the same guy they all are rented for about the same amount and so I could see that there were two different appraisers. There's 10 of them. One appraiser took five, and he has his own company, right? Another appraiser took five, and he's got his own company. They're contractors. Sorry, I just hit you. They're contractors. Um, and so one guy appraised them all for what we were purchasing them for. Another guy appraised them for half. So our lender was like, we won't lend for these because they don't hit our minimum value and so it was hysterical i i contested it but this appraiser just stuck with his numbers and he used really out-of-date comps um comparables yeah. yeah and so it just it was laughable so in the end in the time that i was working on this loan we were able to come up with the cash to close it ourselves and it was actually really satisfying for me to tell the lender to take a hike um, yeah, because you don't want to work. I mean, that's what the problem with these lenders is that they're at the mercy of these terrible appraisers there. I wanted you know. him to grovel a little. I was like, guess what? We're not going to use you. I'm going to pay this cash because that means we save ourselves. I was looking at the numbers over the course of the loan, almost $800,000 in interest. And so I wanted him to be like, no, come back. Let us do it. Let us work. Too. And he was like, OK, great. Maybe another time. So that wasn't all that satisfying. Well, it, you know, it's like, yeah, it's not like you, hanging up on someone. Right. Like, you want your boyfriend to grovel a little when you break up with them, and he didn't. That was... Anyway, that's my feelings we're so, talking about. So, okay, so let's talk about... Okay, so we ended up then paying cash for these properties. So we wired the money in the morning, and it was like, you know, nearly, whatever, a million dollars for the purchase of these properties. And then we end up going to... I end up going to the closing. We're sitting there, and as the conversation unfolded, that's what I kind of... I really wanted to share with you today. Now... There's a couple of key takeaways from this millionaire landlord, right? He's in his 70s. And the reason that there's the term tired landlord is exactly what he went through. He was managing these properties himself. Right. He didn't have a property management company. And that's where he became tired. He became tired of having to collect the rent and placing tenants and all of that stuff, doing background checks. Now, a lot of his tenants have stayed there 30 years. So we're inheriting some tenants that have been there a long time. That's good and bad. And I told him, in my experience, inheriting tenants from a previous landlord can be a thorny mess. Um, and so that that's why he was really willing to sort of work with us in a hands-on capacity yeah. to make the handoff. So this was a real hands-on experience. But more importantly were his experiences in real estate investing. And it's a real perfect rich dad, poor dad story from Robert Kiyosaki. He gets out of the military service in 1968, this gentleman who we bought the properties from, and he went to work at a factory. And at the time he was working at this factory, he started working 80 hours because other people didn't want to work certain hours. And so he would pick up extra shifts. When his boss handed him his first paycheck, he said, this is a lot of money for a young man to this gentleman. And he said, here's my 30 days notice. And the boss was like, what? You just made more money than I can't believe and you're saying I'm goodbye? He, just like Robert Kiyosaki writes about in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, had this moment where he said to himself, I saw myself at this factory for the next 40 years and if I didn't leave then, I would never leave. So he gave him his 30 days notice, he went out and he started selling real estate. And a great story. He's out selling real estate he, he, in 1968 and he was working with an investor. This is in New Jersey. This investor uh, said, uh, Richard, I want to meet you at Sunday at one o'clock. I want to look at this investment property I'm thinking about buying. And Richard said, Sunday, you know, he's a young guy. He says, I want to be down at the shore. You know, when you're, if you're on from the East Coast, you go down the shore. That's the quote, down right. the yeah. shore. You know, if you're from <laughs> Philadelphia, you go down the shore on the weekends. So he wanted to go down the shore. He's like, I want to go Sunday. I'm a young man. I want to go to the shore, meet some girls, you know, in bikinis and whatever. And uh, the guy said, no, no, one o'clock on Sunday. And he said, oh, okay, fine. So he skipped his shore trip that weekend. 
And he goes to the house at one o'clock on a Sunday and he's standing there, he's waiting. It's 1.15, then it's 1.30, then it's 1.45. And, and there's he, no cell phones where you can text the guy, where the heck are you? Right. Like, hey, I'm, I'm here at this investment property you were going to buy and add to your portfolio of properties. Where are you, buddy? And he calls and he says, oh, didn't my wife tell you? I, uh, I'm not interested in that one anymore. So he wasted his whole weekend for this guy. He said, right then and there, I decided that's it. I'm not selling real estate anymore. I'm going to become a real estate investor. This guy had me wrapped around his finger and <laughs> and I had to blow my whole weekend. This guy's living off passive income. Right. That's when he started acquiring assets. He started buying uh, properties, single families. He's like, I don't do anything commercial. And he owns, I think he owned about $7 million worth of real estate, a couple hundred uh, properties. And he's now 71 or in mid 70s and he's selling off uh, certain pieces of his portfolio. And I said to him, why, uh, you know, it didn't, it, it occurred to me because we're going through the closing, we were buying it from him. It, this is a key takeaway. If you, if you don't take anything else away from today's episode, this is one of the big lessons. Number one, he was a tired landlord because he didn't manage the properties. He was managing right. them himself. But what's the other key piece? Well, also I said, did, did it escape your notice that he was selling as a sole proprietor? Because him and his wife both had to show up at the closing to sign because they owned it as husband and wife. They deeded it. To, uh, to us into our LLC so I didn't have to go because I'm part owner of the LLC. Clayton can sign on behalf of the LLC so only one of us had to show up. But he and his wife both had to show up to in sign off on the sale because they own it as a sole proprietor. So this guy, like I said, he's he made so many great moves in his life as a real estate investor and we thought, wow, what an inspiring story. But he didn't have the resources that we had. He didn't have podcasts to learn that you shouldn't own your real estate in a sole proprietorship. He didn't didn't have, you know, maybe quite as many books to know that your taxation rate will be much easier if you own your real estate in an LLC, or he didn't know, you know, that it would be a, a write-off and also much easier on him to have a property manager, and then he could stay in France instead of coming back to deal with his tenants, right? So these are lessons that he could have learned, he just didn't, but he still had made himself a great life off of owning so many of these um, that, what they're not duplexes. They're what? What do we call them? Well, again? like in the like, East Coast, so they're kind of almost like they're almost kind of like a townhouse style yeah. because they're side by side single families with a, you know two doors with a shared wall. They're still deeded as single families. So right. we you know there was five actual properties that we bought ten actual you know there are ten properties, but they're it was like yeah there's five properties, ten deeds. If that makes sense. I guess so. Yeah, right? 10 because single families. 10 single families, right. but there's five physical properties and buildings. Um, but a sole proprietorship, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, that just means they owned it in their own name. Right. Richard Smith and you know Tracy Smith, they owned it in their own names. And right. the reason that that's a huge problem, okay... Not only, I mean, the biggest problem is liability, right? It's. it's I don't know if that's a bigger problem than taxation. Well, that because so, you're okay, not taxed if so, favorably. If, okay, you know, if rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki writes right the, the four kind of key areas, and I'll do a whole episode around this, but on financial IQ, and his number four in that list is the law, and a corporation wrapped around the technical skills of accounting and investing and understanding markets, then can have explosive growth. So. He owned these, he probably had $7 million worth of real estate. He could have probably, I would say doubled his position or even tripled his position if he had purchased these in an LLC. Yeah. The tax benefits favor corporations over sole proprietors. So I don't wanna say that to him, but I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, man, why didn't you own these in an LLC? Well, first of all, LLCs didn't exist until like what, 1970s? So he could have owned them in, a, in an S corporation or some or, or earlier version of a corporation prior to this, or he could have at some point at least did a deeded them in deeded them the into LLC an LLC or whatever, right? And then he could have claimed depreciation. He could have claimed he could have done a whole extra level of things for the business. Then all of his trips, even and he has a house in France. He also has a house in Florida that he rents out. Those trips then become business expenses. As a sole proprietor, they're not a write off, right? There's all of these layers of things that I was shocked. Here's a millionaire landlord, real estate investor, who's done quite well for himself, but he could have done three, four, five times better for himself. Yeah. I know. I was just I, well, these are, I, 
I feel very uncomfortable making assumptions about his well, like, finances. Well, we absolutely but, know. Right. But we absolutely know 100% certainty is that owning them as a sole proprietorship does not work. It, it, you do not get the tax benefits yes. that you get owning right. them in a corporation. Plus the exposure, right? So if one of his some... tenants decided they didn't like him and they didn't like what he was doing and, I don't know, they... <laughs> They got slip and burned fell. by a, by an outlet or whatever. Then they could have taken his whole portfolio from him if they sued. Um, so that's another you know that's another thing to consider. So yes, there there are things that we thought no oh, we we would have done it that way. But for the most part, I felt like we should share this story not to share his mistakes but to share his successes. No, I, I I'm thrilled by my experience to be able to talk with him about these things because another key success that I took away was his battle with code enforcement. As a real estate investor, he his wife got really proud of him. She said, you know, he's an investor. And code enforcement, you know, board of health, they come after, you know, investors. He said, it's ridiculous if you think about it. He said, even in New Jersey, there's like a law now with vacancies. Yeah. That if your house sits vacant, I think for like six months or something, they'll start charging you $1,500 a month. To do it for what? For it being vacant. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So, and Wish now I've known that before we started investing well, in New Jersey. <laughs> well, and then certain municipalities are like three grand. Yeah. Well, our properties are never going to sit vacant for six months. You run into that issue if you're doing like a big rehab. But there's also extra layers and hoops and hurdles. But he battled code enforcement. And code enforcement are the health inspectors. They drive around their fancy little hybrid cars. And they try to ding you for high grass. Or there's a gutter hanging off the house. Right. Or maybe they want you to paint your window sills or that kind of stuff. And he has he has gone to court to battle these code violation letters that he gets. And he would get them. As a real estate investor, you have to expect that you are going to get You're code violations. You're kind of violations. peppered with them, yeah. The, the more you've the got, game. the more you've got coming in. And the more properties you have, the more successful you are, They're, they come. But you've got to make sure you have a team in place. Now, here's the difference, right? Like with the properties I own in Indiana or Michigan or other places, we have a team that handles code enforcement. So if we get a letter in the office for a high grass or there's a gutter or there's a broken window because a kid threw a rock through it, you have a team that can go to the court on your behalf. They can deal with the code enforcement office and take care of it. He would do all this himself. So he would go to these court hearings. Um, I think he said he went to like 40 of them over the years. And he said, I never lost once. I never lost once. Because they're picking on us. You know, they think, mm -hmm. you own this house, you're collecting rent on owning this house. So the money is really coming out of this hardworking factory worker Who or lives whatever, in the place, right? right? Like the money's coming from them to you. So the government's like, I can take some of that. Like I can pick on you because you're not here and you don't, you're not taking, you know, especially out of state owners, which we're not now, but. Um, you know, for several of our properties, we are. So we get targeted for those more. And, you know, you got to just be prepared that the cities sort of think this way. They go after investors because they can. And then you have to have a thick skin about it. And you're like, okay, here's another one. Let's just deal with it. Like heads down and, and deal with it. A lot of times they're thrown out. Um, but every once in a while, that's sort of the cost of business. One story he told was that... Uh he got a code letter because they, they the city wanted him to paint his his uh, paint his house. He's like, "What? Screw you! You know, tell me to paint my house. Who are you? You know?" And uh, I love this story. So, but what they 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 actually didn't want him to paint the house. They wanted him to paint the soffit, which he said, "But the city doesn't know the difference." What is a soffit? The soffit is the overhang of the roof. Okay. It's underneath. A lot of times, if you have siding, it'll have like a white. Okay. white siding underneath yeah, 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 it. Yeah. It sticks out over the actual structure. Okay. You know? um, Maybe they asked me on my real estate test and I don't remember. So a lot of times soffits, I mean, they're underneath the roof. They don't need to be gloriously painted. Um, right. You know, obviously if it needs some touch-up paint, great. Who cares? Um, as long as you've got a good roof and the outside of the house is painted, what do you care? Um, so anyway, he, he, what he said they actually wanted him to do was paint the soffit. But technically on the form, they put paint the house. So he, he said, what? Screw you. He said, you know what I'm going to do? Because he just loved sort of, you know, niggling them because they're, they're such a pain in the butt. He painted the house like a bright lime green, uh -huh. like a fluorescent lime green color. And then he painted the soffits like a really annoying looking red on purpose, just so that it was this horrible eyesore. <laughs> so then they came back and gave him another code violation for the color of his house. 
and he took them to court. So he went to the, well, he didn't take them to court. He went to the hearing, which is free. You go to the hearing at the county level, whatever. And the judge, he said, was sitting there, like kind of leaning back in his chair and sitting there rocking back and forth. And he said, and as he was telling the story about the color of the paint, he, he sat up, the judge sat up and he said, wait a second, let me see if I've got this right. You, Mr. Prosecutor, County Code Enforcement Prosecutor, you're telling this guy what color he can paint his house? Mm-hmm. Or to, to paint his house? And, he, and, the, and the prosecutor said, yeah. And he said, uh-uh, case dismissed, get out of here. Ridiculous. Yeah. So, you know, and it's just his way of like playing with the system. When you understand the rules, you know, they'll send you a, a warning letter for high grass. You get it taken care of, but it's their way of trying to make money on the backs of investors. And it's a, it's you know, it's a sad state of affairs. Like this, the state of New Jersey has like fifty one percent rental um, uh, rental ship right now in the state, um, and all these new tax laws that are coming could really even drive that a little bit higher. Right. So. You know, I, overall, New Jersey is not a great place to invest. This one pocket, this area of the municipality, this one section of the state, which we found some lower taxes than we pay and where we are in New yeah. Jersey, it's not a terribly landlord-friendly state. It's so, just a harder place to find gems. To and find, to do business. Right. To, it's, it's definitely, and especially because the property taxes are higher in New Jersey in general, if the new tax plan goes through, you're going to be double taxed on that money and New Jersey has really high property taxes and you won't be able to write that off onto your federal taxes. So, you know, it's that makes the rental market all the more uh, desirable. But for us now, we'll pay taxes on those investments and that money won't be a write off on our federal taxes. So that kind of sucks. But still, the return on this property really worked. And one of the reasons I really wanted Clayton to meet this guy is because I'd spoken to him on the phone a few times. Um, and when he first when he first sent us the listings of these properties, I was like, I like this package. Um, but he had written a Word document to accompany the listing. And he said, you know, I've been an investor. I own 70 of these properties. I've owned them for 40 years. Um, I've managed them myself. They were, you know, this is the history of it. And he, he wrote this cute little paragraph where he's like, I want you to understand that I'm selling a business opportunity because what you're buying is passive income. What you're buying is, you know, An monthly asset. money coming in. Um, and it was like everything that we already believe in that he had written in a very personal way. And I was like, I'm on this. Um, yeah, he had written it almost as if we didn't understand that. All yeah. Day. Like I gave a rat's ass about a damn appraisal. And I said, no, I know exactly what I'm buying. The ROI makes sense. Right. I'm not I'm not worried about some idiot appraiser who appraised it for 20 grand less than I know that it's worth. Right. Um, it didn't matter because we were buying a business opportunity. We were buying an asset that's producing a high ROI. And also, you know, those appraisals when they came in, there was two of them that said the square footage was below what was, what was acceptable for the lender. So the lender doesn't lend on anything less than, I think, 700 square feet. And the appraisal come, came in, the guy was like, this is 650. They're two bedroom, one bath. And the guy was like, no, they're not. They're all the same. <laughs> right. And he's like, I have a floor plan that even shows that. I have a survey. I mean, they're military housing. They're all literally the same footprint. But this appraiser wouldn't budge. And, you know, for a couple of days, because we were, I still was like, well, we're going with this loan. These appraisers are important. I was really upset about it. I was kind of like, oh, they're not appraising for what I wanted. And now, look, this guy thinks it's worth half of what we're going to pay. Am I being a sucker and paying too much? But I ran the number. And I was like, even if I pay double, right, I'm still getting a 14% return. I still want it. No, because that is the metric. I don't care what the appraiser thinks. Um, And so really that a-hole appraiser was the best thing that could have happened to us for this deal because A, we decided to not use the lender. B, we saved ourselves so much money in... uh, interest for the lo- over the life of that loan and see because we would have closed it much differently with the lender and then Clayton got to meet this person who we thought was really great so and also well unfortunately we did spend five thousand dollars on those appraisals that's the other actually that, we got we got half of, of it back, back oh, yeah, because right. they were a month they also were three weeks late so not this guy was so incompetent I wish I could call him out on the podcast and say never use this appraiser but I can't remember his name um, 
Well, I doubt, unless they happen to be, yeah, I mean. It makes no difference, but it would be satisfying to me. You can tell, like, there's a lot of frustration the, over the over the course of making this deal happen. Well, and that's also the beauty of buying a property with cash. Right. Because I don't care about an appraisal. I don't care what this, you know, moron thinks about this. He Most of these appraisers right now, they're not answerable to anybody. Yeah. And investors are like, or just have had it with appraisers because they're so lazy. Yeah. They don't do their homework. They don't, uh, they don't, don't pull. Don't say that. Th- yeah. There's a lot of them that don't. I mean, we've had. There's We've... a lot of lazy everyone, though. Don't, That's don't true. say that. Okay. All right. So okay. if there's a lesson here... Is that our guy was lazy. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, he was three weeks late, and his appraisers appraisals were crap. Mm-hmm. Um, and I called this single source, you know, at, uh, the people at this um, contracting company were so nice and so helpful. And I was like, okay, but where's the appraiser, <laughs> the, the appraisal? And they're like, we don't know. They were really trying to help me, but they had just chosen a contractor who was a doofus. And so I called them very, 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 very frustrated, but I was really trying to not take it out on them because I knew that they were trying to help me. And I was like, I have to say I'm angry. And they were like, we know, we know, we know. And I was like, I want my money back because we prayed, we, we, now are three weeks late into this closing because you just decided not to deliver. Yeah, and that's um, the other thing. Working with lenders too, you're going to pay like twice as much for appraisal. I mean, so we paid you know five hundred bucks per appraisal on mm-hmm. these, so five thousand dollars. You know, ridiculous. Anyway, not to go down an appraisal rabbit hole. I could do a whole episode on that because I can't stand them. Um, but anyway, I want to wrap it up. It. I want to wrap it up saying you know thank you to this gentleman who I spent two hours with and learned quite a bit. Uh, was really impressed with. Everything that we talk about here on the podcast and living the life that you want to live, the freedom to travel, spend more time with your family. He was a living embodiment. He and his wife were living embodiment of that rule. You know, get creating passive income, owning assets instead of liabilities, and having that produce cash flow on a monthly basis so he could live, so he could travel. Um, and uh, it, it was really, it really is like that rich dad story. And it was remarkable to sort of sit and watch it in the flesh. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah. Can happen to all of us, folks. That's right. I mean, this is just like no one particularly, you know, like he wasn't born with any kind of special talents or tools or birthright, right? It's just someone who followed the signs of his life and followed his gut and felt like he knew best for himself, which was great. So. You never know how you can, you know, how you can inspire or how you can be inspired. It's hopefully this inspired you as well. So thank you so much for downloading and subscribing to the show. Really appreciate it. We've got tons of great resources here. If you're just getting started with real estate investing or you've got 10 properties and you want to take it to the next level and learn about all of the benefits from taxes and how to structure businesses. We've got all of that here. Some great expert interviews that we've had here on the show. Again, we're learning along with you. um, And uh, there are a lot of people who have 50 properties who watch our show. Great. Um, But you can always be learning. Right. Here's an example of this gentleman who I sat down with yesterday. He still didn't know he should have, you know, owned these in a corporation. That there's different tax things he could have done, cost segregation that he could have done on his properties. So there's a lot we're always learning. Even if you're a millionaire real estate investor, you continue to learn up until the day you die. So anyway, thank you so much for subscribing. Go out there, take action, become a real estate investor. We'll see you back here next time, everyone. Bye, everyone.